Okay, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to thank everyone for making it this far in Mises U. So it's Wednesday, you're at the halfway point. So this is now when all of the lectures will become good and uh, <laughs> challenging. Um, <laughs> so I'm here to talk about a project I've been working on for a long time. Uh, and it's with great honor uh, that I've been involved in the project. And it is Conceived in Liberty, Volume 5. The New Republic, 1784 to 1791, okay? Um, so this is another book by, I should have put Murray Rothbard. Uh, there is another book by Murray Rothbard uh, that I'll be talking about. Um, so we'll really be discussing in this presentation uh, two things. So it's talking about the Conceived in Liberty series as a whole, which was one of the many projects Murray Rothbard worked on, his, his series on early American history. And we'll talk about how it initially grew out of his American history project and uh, how it's something that he's working on throughout most of his career. And then I'll be going through the overview of the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty, uh, which is the New Republic. Uh, and this primarily deals with the US Constitution. Okay, So we'll be talking about the Articles of Confederation, uh, the Constitutional Convention, the ratification debates. Over the, uh, over the Constitution, as well as the significance of the U.S. Constitution. So this means it's you with Judge uh, Napolitano's uh, classes on the Constitution. Now with this, this will be a very Constitution-heavy uh, Mises U. Uh, so when I go through the overview of the fifth volume, I'm going to try and, you know, I won't be able to go through everything. I'll we'll, you know, only be able to touch the main points. And I'm going to try and do a good enough job that you're interested enough to buy the book. If I explain it too well, then you're going to say, oh, I don't need to buy the book because he does everything. He talks about everything in the presentation. So with here, I just have to be just mediocre enough, basically, to sort of <laughs> weigh your appetite. And I think I'm perfectly suited for the task. Um, <laughs> all right. So, you know, another Rothbard book. Yes. Uh, Rothbard, in all of his Conceived in Liberty books and uh, his prefaces, he started off with, he says, what, an, another American history book? The reader may be pardoned for the seemingly inexhaustible supply of uh, history books. In this, you'd say, another Murray Rothbard book. Uh, the reader may be, you know, may be pardoned, pardoned for wondering you know, how there's another Rothbard book. He's been dead, uh, and they keep coming out. Uh, but yes, I'm here to tell you that there is another Rothbard book. It is another completed Rothbard book. So here is the Conceived in Liberty series as a whole. Uh, volumes one through four, which form the original series, came out in the 1970s around the bicentennial of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, volumes one and two uh, mainly discussed the uh, history of uh, America up to about 1750, the French and Indian War around that time period. <clears throat> volumes three to four, talk about the, uh, the path to the revolution, uh, the American Revolutionary War, as well as the American Revolutionary War uh, itself. And then volume five, uh, which we'll be discussing the most today, goes through after. So if, you've no if you'll notice here, uh, the last volume was published in 1979, and the fifth volume is published, will be published in uh, 2019. So you know, tried to make it so you get the 40 year anniversary, basically, of the fourth volume. Uh, so never say never, basically. So, you know, it, 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 it came out, or it will come out. Um, all right, so let's talk about the history of Rothbard's history of the United States. So what's quite remarkable about, about the Conceived in Liberty series is that if you ask someone, or oh, what did a prominent academic do in their life? And they say, oh, so-and-so uh, wrote a five-volume series on early American history. Okay, and then you put a period there. And then like maybe they did some book reviews, a couple you know, papers here and there, but that's, you know, that's an incredible accomplishment. You know, that's the CV, basically. They wrote a five-volume series on early American history. Uh, for Rothbard, in the sense that you could, you could have an entire discussion about all of his accomplishments, and then you could say, oh yeah, he also wrote a five-volume series on early American history. And then someone goes, wait, what? Uh, and then you say, oh yeah, this series, it was, it was about 1,800 pages, you know, it was five volumes, it was, it was a little thing there, and you go like, uh, excuse me? Uh, and yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible that this was just one of the major projects of his life. Uh, he was that talented uh, of a, uh, you know, that prolific of an author that, I mean, this was literally just, just one side, you know, pursuit that he poured his energy in. So in the 1950s, uh, he was, as, as we all, uh, as, as hopefully we all know, he was working on man, economy, and state with power and market, uh, and then America's Great Depression. Uh, these two works came out in the 19, uh, early 1960s. Uh, so in the 1950s, he worked a lot on economic theory, 
And then he says, all right, I'm going to switch a little bit in the 1960s, you know, just a little bit. Uh, he's going to switch to a whole new field of American history, uh, something that on, you know, it's, it's something he's, he's also very well trained in. Uh, he got his PhD uh, from Columbia University, uh, and he wrote a book, uh, his dissertation, The Panic of 1819, which is still very well cited today. Okay, it's hard enough to get someone to read, uh, you know, my dissertation that came out like four years ago, but you can still look at American history books, and Murray Rothbard's Panic of 1819 uh, is still referenced. So in the 1960s, Rothbard started to work on a American history project. Uh, he had a research grant sort of from the mid-1960s. Uh, and initially, he thought, all right, it's going to be a you know, one-volume history. Then it kind of said, all right, the plan is for two to three volumes. And he, he sort of broke it up into phases. So the first phase, he said, all right, I'm going to work on early American history. So 1600 to about 1789. It'll take about one and a half years. Uh, phase two, the 1800s. Uh, he said oh, about two years. Uh, then he said phase three, the 1900s up to the present day, back then, circa 1960, about 1 1.5 years. Okay, so this is the original uh, outline. So much like he would sort of have a, a huge treatise on economic theory, uh, man, economy, and state, he would similarly have a huge treatise on uh, American history. Okay, so... The main, uh, another major point of this book was that it would be specifically from a libertarian perspective, okay? And in one of his memos that he wrote, and I think this is very important, uh, he said, you know, why was such a libertarian American history book needed? And I think it's still true today. So he wrote this in 1962, and still decades later, his words, uh, uh, you know, they, they still resonate. So he said, there is perhaps no greater single influence in forming the American mind than its view of American history. While economics, for example, is almost completely confined to specialists into a narrow market at best, works on history, and especially history of the United States, have a far wider and broader market. The student and adult American are, then, shaped by, one, the textbooks used in the scholastic courses, and two, general interpretative works on American history read by adult laymen and by professional historians as well. So what is he saying here? He's basically saying that your average person, if you want to spread the libertarian message, your average person is going to be most convinced by reading some sort of histor historical work, okay? And I know this from my, uh, my own perspective, as I'm sure many of you do as well. When I first got involved in Austrian economics and libertarianism, the work that I devoured the quickest was, all right, refuting the common perceptions on the Great Depression, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Civil War, uh, various sorts of events that, again, we already have background knowledge in. Most people take an American history course. Um, if, you, if you go to, you know, in, in high school in America, uh, people have read history. They find it more interesting. It's less technical, et cetera. Uh, so I think this is, it's still true uh, that you need this because if you want to spread it, you, you still want to have the overarching sort of libertarian history. Another reason he doesn't say specifically here, but this is even more true today, is he said that, well, uh, American history books are generally uh, biased in a statist direction. So they're predominantly liberal uh, in the modern usage of the term, uh, as well as, you know, he says, sometimes there's conservative, uh, which really more of like a neoconservative that every war we've ever fought has been great, uh, and we always needed to fight it, and so on and so forth. Uh, and maybe some tax cuts here and there were all good. Uh, but aside from that, you know, that's the general uh, perspectives you see. Uh, and that's increasingly uh, become true uh, now. So uh, sort of go on. By the end of 1966, uh, Rothbard had only phase one completed. So he had typed drafts of volumes one to four and a handwritten draft of volume five. Okay, so this was the phase one was really what became the five volume conceived in the Liberty series. And the reasons why he had that, I mean, it's incredible within five years, you know, on top of every, other things that projects he's working on, he comes out with literally about 1,800 pages of material. Uh, main reason is that there were problems with typing the manuscript. Uh, so he initially would handwrite the manuscript, then he would dictate it into a recording machine, uh, and then Joey, his wife, uh, would help him uh, type it out. Uh, and he also wanted to devote more time to phase one. He said that well, there's you know, a, lot of pro, you know, a lot of things that have gone un, unmentioned, unnoticed, things like tax rebellions, uh, all sorts of other events, people who are more libertarian than common historians have, uh, have characterized them, et cetera. So he says, you know, I've, I've had to devote more time to this. 
uh, and rightfully so, uh, in my opinion. So he, you know, he, he wanted to spend more and more time. And this is a uh, sort of a familiar uh, uh, occurrence with Rothbard's projects. So Man, Economy, and State started out as a textbook on human action. Okay, uh, that was the initial plan. It became this this, this massive treatise, um, conceived in liberty. I've been talking about this story. Uh, he was talking about the progressive era. Uh, it became much longer uh, than he initially envisioned. His history of economic thought. I mean, he was just someone who was so prolific and so intelligent that you know once you got him to write on something, he would you know he would just keep keep on writing. Basically, he was like the Energizer Bunny. In other words, you know, you just keep going. And Rothbard actually started research on phase two on the 1800s, but he basically had to stop. Uh, he even presented it, some of his findings at a conference with Joseph Dorfman. Uh, the research grant ran out, and he wanted to, or he had to get a job at Brooklyn Polytechnic. Uh, so he became a uh, professor. Uh, so this is sort of the, uh, the, the general kind of evolution of the project. And this is kind of getting to a, a major question that I'm sure many of you have in your mind is saying, okay, so why exactly was the fifth volume uh, never published? Uh, you know, why is it taking uh, 40 years for it to, uh, to come out? Um, <clears throat> so this is Rothbard. He's discussing this more in a 1972 New Banner interview. He's talking about a lot of the projects he has. So he's discussing For New Liberty. He says, oh, I've got betrayal of the American right. Uh, I'm working on ethics of liberty. And now he says, or he's talking about his American history project. He says, in that I've written up to the Constitution. It will be a history of the United States from a libertarian point of view. It is very difficult to write that because the thing is we don't know what has happened. A lot of the facts have been buried. Orthodox histories don't give many facts. A lot of facts are just left out. The manuscript could be used as a textbook, I hope. You know, Man, Economy, and State was originally supposed to be a textbook and wound up, wound up as a giant treatise. I think this might be the same thing, okay? Um, uh, and that, in, in, in truth be told, that is, that is what it became. It became a massive treatise on early American history, okay? So uh, always remember to save your work, <laughs> um, especially nowadays. So Arlington House published volumes one through four in time for the bicentennial. Uh, and what would happen is so Rothbard had those typed out and he would edit them, uh, but to make a long story short, the discs for volume five were ruined, the recording machine. Uh, so it was broke. So only about 60 pages were typed out and uh, instead you had 500 pages uh, of a handwritten manuscript, okay? So you have about 60 pages and you say, okay, this is good. And then all of a sudden, as, as you'll see, as I'll show, uh, you have uh, his handwritten pages. Uh, and this is in Rothbard's own words in an interview in 1991. He says, volume five on the Constitution was written in longhand, and no one can read my handwriting. Um, and he is certainly not lying when he says that. He says, no one can read my handwriting. And he sort of has a statement. You wonder, like, oh, you're kind of being hard on yourself. Like, you know, don't, don't, don't say that, you know. But, yeah, no, you know. Um, so, you know, you have this. And, um, you know, this is just a picture you have. Uh, and this is... Uh, so you can kind of see, you know, we have, we have the, it's a little bit far out, but, uh, so one, it was written in cursive. So it almost looks like the handwriting from the, you know, from the founding fathers, you know, it's like he's writing the Declaration of Independence part two, uh, and, he, and he's going on, uh, and even Thomas Jefferson would be like, hey, how do you read this? Um, and, you know, he's got things crossed out and he's got, he's got arrows and he's got, uh, you know, he's got footnote or paragraph and. He writes things, he writes his ands with, as pluses and, you know, uh, everyone, you know, that, you know that, that's normal. And then, you know, he's got, he's got citations and uh, so basically that was kind of what was there. And so uh, most people would say, who want to start this project would say, eh, I'll, I'll pass, you know, I'll, uh, maybe, maybe later. Um, and so it took someone who had nothing else to do, an enormous amount of time on their hand and really nothing else going on in their life to really... Set, you know, sit down and, you know, and work on the project. And I'm not going to, you know, that was me. But uh, so, so last summer, uh, I decided to literally learn a new language, uh, Rothbardian. Um, and uh, I'll be starting courses soon on that. Uh, and you had to learn each word. And you had to translate it. And at the very beginning, I was, I, was, I, was, I was ready to throw in the towel. It took about a day. And I had two sentences down. 
Uh, but then, it, you know, it kind of picked up and, you know, you learn more and more. And it was about a month and a half of, of, of really just concentrating. And, you know, I was going to sleep and I was seeing his handwriting in my, uh, my, in my head. I said, oh, I only got 150 pages left. Like, okay, uh, you know, we, we, we can do this, Rocky style. Um, so there's more on the actual history of the project, sort of going to this in a new issue uh, of the Austrian. Uh, I'm sure, you know, you can find it uh, downstairs, assuming the other fellows haven't thrown them all out by now. Um, uh, we talk about the, uh, this project. Uh, and you're really interested. I'm happy to talk more about it. But so that's, that's the history of the project, and that's the actual handwriting. So there's about 600 pages of this, okay? Uh, so, uh, but it was, it, was, it was a great experience doing so. All right. So enough about the actual history of the project. Uh, you know, what's, what's the book about? So the book, as, as his other Conceived in Liberty uh, volumes, is divided into parts, and then there's subsections. And so what this book, as I've mentioned, is about, it's, it's, it's about the actual, it's about a period in history that is actually very rarely spoken about. Uh, it's usually kind of rushed over. So you say, all right, you had the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they were adopted in uh, 1781. Uh, the Revolutionary War ended, and then you know, da, 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 the great men at the American, you know, the Constitutional Convention, 1787, Constitution, George Washington's president, 1789, and all right, you know, now we're off to the races, sort of. So the 1780s, not really discussed that much. In the Constitution, uh, its adoption is always portrayed as sort of this, this great event, this significant uh, I mean, rightfully significant, but this this, this uh, beneficial uh, you know procedure and the, the the whole the whole nine yards, and so Rothbard spends a lot of time talking about things that you would never hear about uh, in another American history book. You know, for example, as we'll uh, you know, I briefly just sort of mention here, he talks about how a bunch of states in the West tried to secede from the, uh, the, the, the Articles of Confederation. And there was this forgotten state called Franklin that's literally sandwiched in like North Carolina. And you can find it on Google and you're like, oh, well, I didn't know about that. And, you, know, there, 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 you know, there's a bunch of those kind of lurking in the mist. But so part one and two, he discusses sort of the 1780s, uh, the economic environment and then the foreign policy uh, under the Articles of Confederation. He goes through that, he explains how Many of the pro all the problems were due to sort of government intervention and how things weren't as bad as they were actually portrayed. And then part three is uh, really where the narrative kind of picks off, all right, picks up. And he discusses, you know, you see all the parts, it's the nationalist triumph, the nationalist triumph, the nationalist triumph, the nationalist triumph, right? So he goes through this, this huge series of steps as how the supporters, I'll be talking about the nationalists a little bit more later on, how the supporters of a stronger central government basically secured a plethora of extremely crucial victories. So first they call a constitutional convention, all right? They say they're going to do something else. Uh, they say they're going to do it legally, but, you know, they... They, they, they lie, basically. Um, so they call a constitutional convention. You know, it's in secret. Uh, they draft this constitution all right, at the constitutional convention. All right, then they got to ratify it, again, illegally, uh, as we'll talk about, not by the normal procedure of the Articles of Confederation. And then they have to pass a Bill of Rights to uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, for the, the fears of, of, of those people who didn't want the Constitution, they had to basically calm them down. And as we'll talk about, the Bill of Rights was actually very different than what many of the people who are later known as the Anti-Federalists wanted. So that was even a victory for the, uh, the Nationalists. Okay? So this is just sort of a brief overview, and then we'll be kind of going through each part in more, de in, in more depth. All right. So the year was 1784. You know, I remember it like it was yesterday. Right? Um, it was the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, so now we're going to go through uh, your elementary school history class, right, you know, really fast, you know, this, this one bullet point. The end of the Revolutionary War, uh, 1775 to 1783. Uh, and, you know, these, these final three points Rothbard talks about in Conceived in Liberty, Volume 4. So you have the centralizing Articles of Confederation enacted. Uh, so as Judge uh, Napolitano mentioned in his Monday night talk, uh, most people would say that the Articles of Confederation, wholly inadequate, total chaos, total decent, totally decentralized, uh, was weak, and only Rothbard, the historian, would call it the halfway house to a stronger government, the Constitution. Uh, so, you know, Rothbard spoke about how the Articles of Confederation was a centralizing measure uh, to actually, you know, it, 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 it caused problems. Instead, the, the 13 colonies, soon become 13 independent states, should have remained just that, independent. 
uh, or at least in separate confederacies. Um, and then you have a failed power drive by Robert Morris. So he was a major financier, the guy in charge, the treasurer in charge of the Revolutionary War, uh, enormously influential to someone who I'm sure many of you are more familiar with, and that's Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and then you have the Treaty of Paris formalizes uh, U.S. independence in 1783. All right, so here we are, 1784. We we're all caught up. Uh, we, you know, uh, we can now pass our AP U.S. history course uh, and all of that. So the Confederation Congress... Uh, it was called the Continental Congress before the Articles of Confederation. Now it's called the Confederation Congress. Uh, and the states have a huge wartime debt. This is the central problem, basically, of the 1780s. Um, and it's increasingly held by wealthy speculators. So why they have such a huge debt? Basically, the, the United States, uh, or the colonies at least initially, they made the choice to fight the war with a formal army rather than sort of guerrilla warfare. And this is a very important point uh, that Rothbard discusses in Conceiving Liberty, Volume 4. He says guerrilla warfare, it's the more libertarian way of fighting. You need a less regimented, ossified, bureaucratic structure. It's less expensive. People know their own home territory. Uh, and this was actually where all of the uh, United States, uh, you know, or the, the patriots, basically, victories came from. It was mainly in guerrilla warfare, uh, you know, ambushes, et cetera, not pitched battles. And this is why he sort of looks uh, downly upon George Washington, because he wanted to fight all the, m many of his battles, sort of, you know, pitched battles. And, you know, his most successful victory, you know, uh, Trenton, where he, you know, he crosses the Delaware River Christmas, uh, Christmas night, you know, was precisely an ambush attack. So it's not like, a, hey, we're going to meet you at this, uh, the, you know, the, this field, uh, five o'clock, be there, bring the drinks. Um, you know, that, you know, how it was done back in the day. So, and this is, this is discussed, and usually when historians mention this, they say, oh, you know, this, this debt uh, that you had to pay farmers and soldiers with, uh, you couldn't just, you had to pay it off because it's held by the people who fought the war. You know, the poor farmers, uh, you know, who, who gave their crops, uh, the soldiers, etc. cetera. Uh, but in reality, as Rothbard mentions, this is the point that isn't really properly emphasized, is that it was all those people, most of those people sold their securities at vastly, um, you know, depreciated rates to speculators. They needed money now. They couldn't wait 10 years uh, for the government to pay them off. So it was held by wealthy speculators, uh, and it was also held increasingly uh, in the North in particular. So Rothbard's solution, basically, you know, you have this federal debt as well as the state debt. You know, you should have divided it up among the states and then let them default or repudiate however they felt. So a decentralized method. So default is when you just stop making some payments, and repudiate is when you just totally cancel the contract, you don't give them anything. Uh, and this was something Rothbard would discuss multiple times that, uh, you know, the debt, you don't actually need to pay off government debt. It's backed, it's backed by basically a coercive means of payment, right, uh, taxation. So in terms of the massive federal debt we have now, uh, it would take so long, it would take an enormous amount of tax revenue to actually pay it off. Uh, the best way is basically to default or even better, to repudiate the national debt. So some states uh, defaulted by printing money, uh, basically just paying creditors or the debt holders in depreciated money, saying like, all right, this is what you get. Take it or leave it. Uh, which, uh, others raised taxes, right? Um, and both of these caused problems of their own, as I'll, as I'll discuss. So this is the, the year 1784, dot, dot, dot. And, well, what we also have in 1784 is a depression, Okay, so at the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, you have a war-ravaged economy. Uh, independence came at a very high price, so you had hyperinflation printing the continental currency. Uh, you had military confiscation of goods. You had the British pillaging of infrastructure and supplies, uh, and you had the flight of loyalists uh, in their capital. Okay, so the loyalists were those uh, colonists who said, oh, I want to stick with uh, Great Britain. So they leave to Canada, to the British West Indies, or back to uh, Great Britain proper. Uh, so, you know, you have that enormous shock. Uh, and then after the war, the U.S. had to readjust to uh, trading realities. Okay, so during the war, uh, a whole bunch of artificial manufacturing was stimulated because basically they weren't allowed to trade legally with Great Britain anymore. So... After the war, Great Britain says, all right, we'll export our goods to you, but they're still stuck in the, in the thralls of a mercantilist fallacy, but they say, all right, you're, you're not allowed to export to us, particularly the British West Indies, all right? So that naturally hurts us. That's a negative government uh, interference, basically hampering our trading capabilities. And now you also have efficient British manufactured goods uh, outcompeting inefficient Americans, 
right? Because all of these American manufacturing, uh, that was only uh, basically uh, profitable because uh, it was the wartime economy, all right? So you have these massive uh, trade adjustments that have to occur. It's beneficial. There's going to be a process, though. And then you have sort of a brief uh, boom-bust credit expansion uh, from the Bank of North America, the Bank of Massachusetts, and the Bank of New York that Rothbard uh, discusses. And all of these basically lead to a problem that many Americans thought uh, it was a huge issue, is this, this chronic excess of imports, okay? Uh, and the really sort of the excess, quote, of imports came from all the negative government shocks that caused this, uh, and it led to sort of stagnation in the economy. Uh, and this depression, of course, was aggravated by states printing money uh, and raising taxes uh, to pay off their debts. Okay? So many states, uh, in particular Massachusetts, uh, drastically raised taxes, okay? uh, which really hurt a lot of people who were, you know, they just suffered from under a, you know, the war economy. Uh, it was hard for them uh, to pay off. Uh, you know, the, the, um, it was hard for them to pay the taxes, and then the government was taking their goods, throwing them in debtor's prison. In Shays' Rebellion, a very significant event uh, that you, uh, so Daniel Shays' um, uh, Rebellion uh, in, in Massachusetts, a lot of, it was a big, big significant event behind the, um, the articles, uh, you know, scrapping the Articles of Confederation, moving the Constitution. As Rothbard discussed, it was mainly a tax revolt. Massachusetts uh, primarily um, put uh, their taxes on the, uh, on the poor interior uh, farmers, okay? So naturally, they're going to uh, revolt. Um, states also erected tariffs and navigation acts. So navigation acts are various regulations on shipping, uh, but interstate competition made them very ineffective. So the extent that point is ever spoken about in your in American history class, you say, oh, all these states enacted all these barriers, and it was all, all sorts of problems because if you wanted to, you know, buy goods from Pennsylvania and you lived in New Jersey, you had to pay, you know, like a 90% tariff. Actually, the tariff rates were quite low, and that's simply because of competition, all right? Uh, if one state has high tariffs or strict navigation acts, other states are sort of incentivized to undercut them, all right? So what you really need in order for tariffs in these types of regulations to work is you need a national tariff, or a national navigation act. Uh, but the issue is that those failed uh, under the Articles of Confederation uh, because particularly to raise revenue, uh, that was the one, one power the, the Articles of Confederation did not have. And everyone, when you hear about them talk about it, they, they, they wail, they complain, they say the government did not have the power to raise revenue. And Rothbard was like, that's great, <laughs> okay? Because uh, they can only rely on the states for voluntary requisitions. Uh, and generally, the states were parsimonious with those uh, requisitions. Uh, so if you separate the power of the purse from the power of the sword, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's actually a good mechanism. Uh, so those failed, and that was because primarily to get a tariff, you need to have unanimity. So every state legislature, in order to pass an amendment to have a tariff, had to agree to it. In these two main uh, drives, um, basically one sta state, Rhode Island, and then New York uh, refused to pass it. So even with all of this, the economy was not as bad as contemporaries argued. Uh, and usually those contemporaries who argue that the economy is bad, uh, they were in favor of a stronger central government. Okay, so they say, oh, it's chaotic. We need a stronger central government. We need to revise the articles uh, because uh, of all of these problems uh, that, that were going on. In the Confederation Congress, uh, 1786, 1787, they were about to throw in the towel on the debt. So they were going to say, all right, we can't pay off the federal debt. Uh, we're going to have to just divide it up amongst the states and then let them do as they please, okay? And if that happened, that would have kind of meant the end in the sense that the Confederation would have been permanently weakened uh, and it would have either remained in this weakened state or would have broken up uh, into uh, various confederacies uh, and so on. Uh, so by 1787, of course, that's not the path that was taken. Uh, and instead, you have the nationalist forces are coalescing. So the nationalists are those groups that they didn't want a, confed a confederation of basically separate states where power is decentralized. Instead, they wanted a nation where you have centralized power. And the states are in a greatly weakened uh, condition, and you say all but emasculated, basically. So you have this group of people. Uh, you have speculative public creditors. They want the debt paid off. 
okay? They want the government to pay it off at its face value because they bought it at such a depreciated price they would stand to make a killing. And that eventually happened under Alexander Hamilton's, uh, basically one of his first major policies as uh, Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington. You have ex-army officers. They want a strong standing army, okay? Because uh, they want it to be sort of hereditary. They want to belong um, to this, the, the, this, this army uh, interest group um, they can benefit from. You have manufacturers who want a centralizing tariff to block out uh, more efficient Europeans. Uh, producers. You have merchants who want a centralizing navigation act to block out uh, European shippers. You have land speculators uh, who are who have you know who have claims to land, even though it's not really just claims. They they didn't really homestead it. Uh, they want to prevent Western secession. Uh, various states and regions linked up with the Mississippi River uh, might secede and sort of break off and join uh, with Spain, owned the uh, Mississippi River at that time. You have Southerners who want to control the Spanish Mississippi River. You have land speculators and Northerners who want to uh, control the British Northwest, or at least get them to leave their forts. You have Southern slave owners who want to protect slavery and encourage the spread of slavery. And you have commercial farmers who want an aggressive foreign policy in the West Indies and Europe. So you have all these groups, and who are they against? They say, we want to benefit at the expense of uh, basically the poor interior uh, farmer in the West, which also just so happened to be the majority of the country. All right. So you say, all right, we want all these special privileges. And of course, they disagree amongst themselves. But what's the one thing they agree on? They say, we want a stronger government. So they're coalescing. Uh, and they leave it up to James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Virginia, Alexander Hamilton of New York. Uh, so they go, they go to work, so to speak. So they're, they're uh, very famous uh, partners during this um, uh, this process, uh, and then in the 1790s, quite famously, they they split. So they're no longer besties, basically. Uh, they used to be great friends. Now, you know, now they don't even talk. Um, so they organize a all-state convention uh, to revise the Articles of Confederation legally. Okay. So what do I mean by legally? Is that means you stick to revising the Articles. Uh, so you're not going to create a new government. You stick with the actual government of the Articles of Confederation, and then the Revisions must be first approved by the Confederation Congress and then the state legislatures unanimously. That's how, if you want to actually bring about revisions in the Articles of Confederation, that's the way you got to do it. Okay. So that all-state convention is the Philadelphia Convention from May, uh, late May to September 1787, and it's dominated by nationalists. So it's mainly in control of the people who want a stronger government. There's only a couple of people... Uh, who are actually would later be called anti-federalists. They want to keep the Articles Confederation, or they want a you know only a some minor revisions. Uh, so naturally, if the convention's dominated uh, by people who want stronger government, what are you going to get? You're going to get uh, a stronger government. So you have most of the prominent people uh, in American history there. There there are some notable absences. John Adams is away at minister to England. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, minister to France, uh, Patrick Henry, sort of the, the fiery uh, Virginian who said, uh, you know, give me liberty or give me death. He declined to attend because he said he smelt a rat, uh, and that uh, turned out to be correct. Um, and you have, you have some others, but you have, you, you, you have all the famous. You have George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, uh, James Madison, Robert Morris, uh, Governor Morris, you have, you, know, you have the whole cast of characters. They're all there. Uh, all the same people who are trying to push for a stronger government in the early 1780s during the Revolutionary War, they're back for the party six years later. So this is Rothbard's quote. Uh, you, know, you could spend a whole lecture, you could spend a whole week on the Constitutional Convention. So he goes through the U.S. Constitution. This is sort of a great summary. And he says, the Constitution is unquestionably a high nationalist document. This is very important because we'll talk about later sort of common uh, perceptions of the Constitution. And then he goes through various things. He says, congressional selection of the president was changed to chosen by popular election, all right, uh, actually to weaken the power of the states uh, and indirectly the people. Admission of new states was made purely arbitrary, okay, this is to keep the eastern states in domination. The amendment power was transferred from the states to the Congress to basically keep the federal government in control uh, of, of amendments. 
And then loopholes existed in the enumerated list. So you see how, oh, the government, we, it's strictly enumerated powers. And you go through, all right, so you go through some of these, the National Supremacy Clause, the dominance of the federal judiciary, the virtually unlimited power to tax, raise armies and navies, make war and regulate commerce, the Necessary and Proper Clause, the powerful general welfare loophole, all allowed the virtually absolute supremacy uh, of the central government. Okay, so you have a lot of loopholes that, and truth be told, if you look at actually the, the progress of how uh, more and more invasive features, uh, government intervention in American history were justified, it was mainly through a lot of these clauses. Rothbard continues, and he says, while libertarian restraints were placed on state powers, which was good, he said, no Bill of Rights existed to check the federal government. That was done on purpose, because the nationalists were okay with restricting the powers of the states, but not the power of the uh, federal government. Uh, and he says, and quite crucially, he says, and slavery was cemented into American society by the nationalist 20-year guarantee of the slave trade in the three-fifths clause representing slaves in Congress uh, and in the compulsory fugitive slave clause. The northern nationalists were willing, if shamefacedly, to agree in exchange for the right to regulate commerce um, and thus grant themselves commercial privileges while the Southern nationalists were willing to concede regulation of commerce in confident expectation of an early slave state preponderance in Congress for the South and Southwest. Okay, so the North wanted uh, many of their mercantilist regulations, the South wanted those too, but the South said, okay, we have to be able to protect slavery. Uh, so if you didn't have the Constitution, you can imagine a sort of a decentralized way, which was actually what was occurring in the 1780s of slavery dying out um, sort of uh, peacefully at least unlike the Civil War later. Um, so all right, you have this high nationalist document. Um, all right, now you, gotta, now you gotta ratify it some way, all right? So the Constitution basically illegally said that the Confederation Congress did not have to approve the document. I mean, they, they sent it to them anyway, and they said, all right, what do you think? If you like it, great. If not, oh, oh well, we're still doing this. Um, and then the US Constitution was sent to special, quote, ratifying conventions rather than the state legislatures. Uh, explicitly because the people at the convention knew that it would uh, be easier to pass. And then they said only nine states were needed, not unanimity. So there's nothing actually legal about the whole thing. Even if you charitably say the U.S. Constitution was an amendment, you just say the giant thing was an amendment, uh, the, the actual process did, you know, was not according to the rules, so to speak. And at this point, there were really two sides. You had the Federalists, uh, the Nationalists, Okay, they called themselves Federalists for tactical effect. They say, oh, it's a strictly um, you know, limited government, powers diffused among the executive, you know, the legislative, and the judiciary. Um, in reality, they were nationalists. And then they called um, the true Federalists anti-Federalists. Right? And that just doesn't sound nice. If you say someone's anti, like if you had the two-party system where the Democrats and the anti-Democrats or the Republicans and the anti-Republicans, one of those is just going to prevent, you know, when you say so you're anti, it's just, you know, you're just negative, right? Looking at the glass half empty. Um, and, you know, the actual ratification process, which is, in my opinion, the, uh, you know, my favorite part of the book, um, it's not the social contract theory of state formation. And is what we're taught in schools that we all get together, um, you know, we all agree, we all unanimously agree to a government, we all hold hands, uh, and then, you know, we're happy, and then we not only sign our lives away, we sign our children's lives, and our children, you know, we all agree to this thing in, you know, basically forever. Uh, in reality, it fits much more with the uh, conquest or the coercive theory, where a government is sort of coercively imposed on people against their will, and then they just sort of learn to get used to it, basically. Um, so you look at the ratification debates, and the Federalists had the advantage. Un, un, you know, un, undeniably, they had the advantage. One, they had superior leadership. The more eminent men, the America's great men, as Rothbard calls it, were in favor of the government. Why? Uh, because as Rothbard discusses, he says, great men are almost always generally in favor of, of, government, of, of bigger government because that's how they got their power or that's how they can continue to augment their power. Uh, the Federalists also had uh, control of the newspapers and the mail. All right, so much you know, they had all they control of all the uh, all the great newspapers of the day, like Facebook and Twitter and CNN and Washington, you know, the Washington Post, et cetera. Um, but they would basically stifle uh, opposition. Uh, it would take longer for anti-federalist mail uh, to be delivered, and sometimes the mail would be opened up and, and you know and cut up and, and all this stuff. Um, 
And they generally, sometimes they lied, uh, but the, you know, the, about anti-federalists. So naturally, if you control the newspapers, which back in the day was, the, you know, the, the vital, you know, source of uh, information, uh, you're naturally going to be able to sway more people. Very crucially, uh, in fact, this was really the main reason why the Constitution was ratified, uh, it was there's a malapportionment of delegates. Uh, to these state conventions, much like the existing state legislatures, the western regions were underrepresented. Okay? So they weren't actually able to send as many delegates as uh, their population warranted. Okay? So, and this was something that naturally the older eastern sections did on purpose uh, in the state legislatures as well as the con uh, constitution to basically increase their weight. Right? So it was like an ancient form of gerrymandering. All right? uh, they bribed anti-federalist delegates. Okay? Um, quite crucially as well, they promised them restrictive amendments after ratification, uh, which is saying, like, all right, give us the keys to complete power, and we'll do what we say after you give us the keys, right? Which isn't really the best way, kind of, 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 of doing things. You say, no, nah, why don't we do this before? Um, some parts of the states uh, actually threatened to secede unless um, the state would ratify. New York City threatened to break off from New York. New York was an enormously anti-federal state. They said, we're going to secede. Uh, one of the main reasons was, or two of the, the, two of the reasons were they were hit hard by the Depression, and they were also the existing capital, uh, the, the site of the Confederation Congress. And so if they weren't allowed to be in the new government, all the power and the privileges, uh, the swamp would basically move. So they wanted to keep it there uh, for, for a little bit. Uh, and then there was actually threats of hostile retaliatory trade legislation against those states that didn't join. So little Rhode Island was the last state uh, to basically have the original 13 co uh, states to, to join. Uh, and why did they do so? It's because draconian trade legislation was basically impending in the Senate, uh, in the new uh, U.S. Senate. If they, if they didn't join, they said, all right, you don't have to join, but we're basically going to, you know, just quarantine you, <laughs> for, for lack of a better term. Um, and um, so Rothbard goes through fascinating discussions in Massachusetts, uh, in New York, uh, in Virginia, sort of the toughest large anti-federal states. Uh, you know, he goes through how sort of all the uh, chicanery, one of his favorite you know, words he uses, and, in, in, uh, you know, just general shenanigans uh, occur to basically allow all of these states to very, you know, barely ratify to join. Uh, and it talks about how actually they didn't represent the true, uh, you know, their pop the, the population of the state's wishes uh, and so on. Um, so then we go to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution was ratified in the summer of 1788. New, New Hampshire is the ninth state and Virginia and New York followed, uh, they follow shortly thereafter. And then North Carolina and Rhode Island uh, ratified later. So actually when George Washington was initially, rat uh, was initially uh, excuse me, inaugurated, uh, two states had not yet ratified. Uh, and the Anti-Federalists, they were fuming, right, because they were upset. They said, we've been tricked, we've been cheated. They said, all right, you promised us the restrictive amendments, restrictions on taxing, restrictions on national supremacy, on standing armies, uh, and so on. Uh, and we want a second constitutional convention, all right, where, where we can be invited to. Uh, and so basically all the Federalists go, no, 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 no. we're not doing that, because they know what's going to happen. Uh, and so in the House of Representatives, Congressman James Madison sort of strategically pushes for a Bill of Rights uh, to sort of thwart the opposition, okay? So it were mainly personal liberty amendments in uh, a weak structural amendment, the 10th Amendment, okay? Uh, which quite crucially in the Articles of Confederation said expressly delegated, so all powers, you know, they're not expressly delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states, and now it just said delegated. Okay, and that was a bone of contention among many anti-federalists and later was exploited uh, by Alexander Hamilton uh, in the 1790s. Uh, and what's also important is the Bill of Rights, we all cherish them now. In fact, most people will probably say the Bill of Rights, particularly you know, like the First Amendment, et cetera, uh, those, you know, the best parts of the Constitution, well, those weren't actually even really part of the Constitution at all. And what's also funny is that the Bill of Rights was more or less kind of discarded by uh, contemporaries. Uh, the 1798 Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, the constitution of that was upheld. You can't criticize the federal government. Uh, that might violate free speech, I think. I don't know. Uh, the Embargo Act, um, you know, later on, we can talk about this. Uh, search and seizure um, and all, all sorts of uh, rights were also disregarded. Uh, so it wasn't really as sort of an ironclad protection um, uh, and it sort of later became, as we'll talk about. 
Uh, so just sort of wrap up the anti-federalists, uh, in order to stay relevant, uh, they interpreted the Constitution strictly. So you said, all right, the Federalists lied to us in the ratification debates. We're going to take that lie uh, for our own, you know, to, to basically uh, make the government you, you promised us. And along with some uh, Federalists, uh, Thomas Jefferson eventually came out for the Constitution, sort of. James Madison, uh, for his own reasons, in the 1790s. Uh, and so that's how, you know, the, the, the strict constitutionalists, they were actually really the uh, sort of the children of the anti-federalists, okay? And in the 1790s, you have the Hamiltonian Federalists versus the Republicans, coalition of anti-federalists and disgruntled federalists by Jefferson and Madison. That last part, that last bullet point, that's just kind of a segue into current history. That's not spoken about so much uh, in the actual book. Uh, so that's just sort of the, the overall narrative uh, so just in conclusion, really, uh, to wrap this up, so one, Rothbard, as always, provides a unique and radical interpretation of American history. Uh, Rothbard also has most uh, more, more after-death publications than Tupac, uh, as someone brought up to me before, and what I think is, uh, is true. I mean, literally, just new stuff just keeps coming out. Um, and he's been dead since 1995. Uh, you should read the book when it comes out in October. Uh, and in the meantime... Uh, you should read the, the Progressive Era, which is uh, for sale in the bookstore downstairs. Uh, so with that, I think I will stop. Thank you so much.